Justice Breyer, with whom Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan join, dissenting. In 2020, 45,222 Americans were killed by firearms. Since the start of this year, 2022, there have been 277 reported mass shootings, an average of more than one per day. Gun violence has now surpassed motor vehicle crashes as the leading cause of death among children and adolescents. Many states have tried to address some of the dangers of gun violence just described by passing laws that limit in various ways who may purchase, carry, or use firearms of different kinds. The court today severely burdens states' efforts to do so. It invokes the Second Amendment to strike down a New York law regulating the public carriage of concealed handguns. In my view, that decision rests upon several serious mistakes. First, the court decides this case on the basis of the pleadings, without the benefit of discovery or an evidentiary record. As a result, it may well rest its decision on a mistaken understanding of how New York's law operates in practice. Second, the court wrongly limits its analysis to focus nearly exclusively on history. It refuses to consider the government interests that justify a challenged gun regulation, regardless of how compelling those interests may be. The Constitution contains no such limitation, and neither do our precedents. Third, the court itself demonstrates the practical problems with its history-only approach. In applying that approach to New York's law, the court fails to correctly identify and analyze the relevant historical facts. Only by ignoring an abundance of historical evidence supporting regulations restricting the public carriage of firearms can the court conclude that New York's law is not consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. In my view, when courts interpret the Second Amendment, it is constitutionally proper, indeed often necessary, for them to consider the serious dangers and consequences of gun violence that lead states to regulate firearms. The Second Circuit has done so and has held that New York's law does not violate the Second Amendment. I would affirm that holding. At a minimum, I would not strike down the law based only on the pleadings, as the court does today, without first allowing for the development of an evidentiary record and without considering the state's compelling interest in preventing gun violence. I respectfully dissent. The question before us concerns the extent to which the Second Amendment prevents democratically elected officials from enacting laws to address the serious problem of gun violence, and yet the court today purports to answer that question without discussing the nature or severity of that problem. In 2017, there were an estimated 393.3 million civilian-held firearms in the United States, or about 120 firearms per 100 people. That is more guns per capita than in any other country in the world. Unsurprisingly, the United States also suffers from a disproportionately high rate of firearm-related deaths and injuries. In 2015, approximately 36,000 people were killed by firearms nationwide. Of those deaths, 22,018, or about 61%, were suicides. 13,463, 37%, were homicides. And 489, 1%, were unintentional injuries. On top of that, firearms caused an average of 85,694 emergency room visits for non-fatal injuries each year between 2009 and 2017. Worse yet, gun violence appears to be on the rise. By 2020, the number of firearm-related deaths had risen to 45,222. That means that in 2020, an average of about 124 people died from gun violence every day. As I mentioned above, 
Gun violence has now become the leading cause of death in children and adolescents, surpassing car crashes, which had previously been the leading cause of death in that age group for over 60 years. And the consequences of gun violence are borne disproportionately by communities of color, and black communities in particular. The dangers posed by firearms can take many forms. Newspapers report mass shootings occurring at an entertainment district in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Three dead and 11 injured. An elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, 21 dead. A supermarket in Buffalo, New York, 10 dead, 3 injured. A series of spas in Atlanta, Georgia, 8 dead. A busy street in an entertainment district of Dayton, Ohio, 9 dead and 17 injured. A nightclub in Orlando, Florida, 50 dead and 53 injured. A church in Charleston, South Carolina, 9 dead. A movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, 12 dead and 50 injured. An elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut, 26 dead, and many, many more. Since the start of this year alone, 2022, there have already been 277 reported mass shootings, an average of more than one per day. And mass shootings are just one part of the problem. Easy access to firearms can also make many other aspects of American life more dangerous. Consider, for example, the effect of guns on road rage. In 2021, an average of 44 people each month were shot and either killed or wounded in road rage incidents, double the annual average between 2016 and 2019. Some of those deaths might have been avoided if there had not been a loaded gun in the car. The same could be said of protests. A study of 30,000 protests between January 2020 and June 2021 found that armed protests were nearly six times more likely to become violent or destructive than unarmed protests. Or domestic disputes. Another study found that a woman is five times more likely to be killed by an abusive partner if that partner has access to a gun. Or suicides. A study found that men who own handguns are three times as likely to commit suicide than men who do not, and women who own handguns are seven times as likely to commit suicide than women who do not. Consider, too, interactions with police officers. The presence of a gun in the hands of a civilian poses a risk to both officers and civilians. Amici prosecutors and police chiefs tell us that most officers who are killed in the line of duty are killed by firearms. They explain that officers in states with high rates of gun ownership are three times as likely to be killed in the line of duty as officers in states with low rates of gun ownership. They also say that states with the highest rates of gun ownership report four times as many fatal shootings of civilians by police officers compared to states with the lowest rates of gun ownership. These are just some examples of the dangers that firearms pose. There is, of course, another side to the story. I am not simply saying that guns are bad. Some Americans use guns for legitimate purposes, such as sport, certain types of employment, or self-defense. Balancing these lawful uses against the dangers of firearms is primarily the responsibility of elected bodies, such as legislatures. It requires consideration of facts, statistics, expert opinions, predictive judgments, relevant values, and a host of other circumstances which together make decisions about how, when, and where to regulate guns more appropriately. That consideration counsels modesty and restraint on the part of judges when they interpret and apply the Second Amendment. Consider for one thing that different types of firearms may pose different risks and serve different purposes. The court has previously observed that handguns, the type of firearm at issue here, are the most popular weapon chosen by Americans for self-defense in the home.
But handguns are also the most popular weapon chosen by perpetrators of violent crimes. In 2018, 64.4% of firearm homicides and 91.8% of non-fatal firearm assaults were committed with a handgun. Handguns are also the most commonly stolen type of firearm. 63% of burglaries resulting in gun theft between 2005 and 2010 involved the theft of at least one handgun. Or consider, for another thing, that the dangers and benefits posed by firearms may differ between urban and rural areas. Firearm-related homicides and assaults are significantly more common in urban areas than rural ones. For example, from 1999 to 2016, 89.8% of the 2013 175 firearm-related homicides in the United States occurred in metropolitan areas. Justice Alito asks why I have begun my opinion by reviewing some of the dangers and challenges posed by gun violence and what relevance that has to today's case. All of the above considerations illustrate that the questions of firearm regulation presents a complex problem, one that should be solved by legislatures rather than courts. What kinds of firearm regulations should a state adopt? Different states might choose to answer that question differently. They may face different challenges because of their different geographic and demographic compositions. A state like New York, which must account for the roughly 8.5 million people living in the 303 square miles of New York City, might choose to adopt different and stricter firearm regulations than states like Montana or Wyoming, which do not contain any city remotely comparable in terms of population or density. For a variety of reasons, states may also be willing to tolerate different degrees of risk and therefore choose to balance the competing benefits and dangers of firearms differently. The question presented in this case concerns the extent to which the Second Amendment restricts different states and the federal government from working out solutions to these problems through the democratic processes. The primary difference between the court's view and mine is that I believe the amendment allows states to take account of the serious problems posed by gun violence that I've just described. I fear that the court's interpretation ignores those significant dangers and leaves states without the ability to address them. New York State requires individuals to obtain a license in order to carry a concealed handgun in public. I address the specifics of that licensing regime in greater detail below because at this stage in the proceedings, the parties have not had an opportunity to develop the evidentiary record. I refer to facts and representations made in petitioner's complaint and in amicus briefs filed before us. Under New York's regime, petitioners Brandon Koch and Robert Nash have obtained restricted licenses that permit them to carry a concealed handgun for certain purposes at certain times and places. They wish to expand the scope of their licenses so that they can carry a concealed handgun without restriction. Koch and Nash are residents of Rensselaer County, New York. Koch lives in Troy, a town of about 50,000 located eight miles from New York's capital city of Albany, which has a population of about 98,000. Nash lives in Averill Park, a small town 12.5 miles from Albany. Koch and Nash each applied for a license to carry a concealed handgun. Both were issued restricted licenses that allowed them to carry handguns only for purposes of hunting and target shooting. But they wanted unrestricted licenses that would allow them to carry concealed handguns for personal protection and all lawful purposes. They wrote to the licensing officer in Rensselaer County, Justice Richard McNally, a justice of the New York Supreme Court, requesting that the hunting and targeting shooting restrictions on their licenses be removed. After holding individual hearings for each petitioner, Justice McNally denied their requests. He clarified that in addition to hunting and target shooting, 
Coke and Nash could carry concealed for purposes of off-road backcountry, outdoor activities similar to hunting, for example, fishing, hiking, and camping. He also permitted Coke, who was employed by the New York Court Systems Division of Technology, to carry to and from work, but he reaffirmed that Nash was prohibited from carrying a concealed handgun in locations typically open to and frequented by the general public. Neither Koch nor Nash alleges that he appealed Justice McNally's decision. Instead, petitioners Koch and Nash, along with the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, Inc., brought this lawsuit in federal court against Justice McNally and other state representatives responsible for enforcing New York's firearm laws. Petitioners claimed that the state's refusal to modify Koch's and Nash's licenses violated the Second Amendment. The district court dismissed their complaint. It followed Second Circuit precedent holding that New York's licensing regime was constitutional. The Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit affirmed, we granted certiori to review the constitutionality of New York's denial of petitioners' license and applications. As the court recognizes, New York's licensing regime traces its origins to 1911 when New York enacted the Sullivan Law, which prohibited public carriage of handguns without a license. Two years later, in 1913, New York amended the law to establish substantive standards for the issuance of a license. Those standards have remained the foundation of New York's licensing regime ever since, a regime that the court now, more than a century later, strikes down as unconstitutional. As it did over 100 years ago, New York's law today continues to require individuals to obtain a license before carrying a concealed handgun in public. Because the state does not allow the open carriage of handguns at all, a concealed carry license is the only way to legally carry a handgun in public. This licensing requirement applies only to handguns, example, pistols and revolvers, and short-barreled rifles and shotguns, not to all types of firearms. For instance, the state does not require a license to carry a long gun, example, a rifle or a shotgun over a certain length, in public. To obtain a concealed carry license for a handgun, an applicant must satisfy certain eligibility criteria. Among other things, he must generally be at least 21 years old and of good moral character, and he cannot have been convicted of a felony dishonorably discharged from the military, or involuntarily committed to a mental hygiene facility. If these and other eligibility criteria are satisfied, New York law provides that a concealed carry license shall be issued to individuals working in certain professions, such as judges, corrections officers, or messengers of a banking institution or express company. Individuals who satisfy the eligibility criteria but do not work in one of these professions may still obtain a concealed carry license, but they must additionally show that proper cause exists for the issuance thereof. The words proper cause may appear on their face to be broad, but there is a substantial body of law instructing licensing officials on the application of this standard. New York courts have interpreted proper cause to include carrying a handgun for target practice, hunting, or self-defense. When an applicant seeks a license for target practice or hunting, he must show a sincere desire to participate in target shooting and hunting. When an applicant seeks a license for self-defense, he must show a special need for self-protection distinguishable from that of the general community. Whether an applicant meets these proper cause standards is determined in the first instance by a licensing officer in the city or county where the applicant resides. In most counties, the licensing officer is a local judge. For example, in Rensselaer County, the licensing officer who denied petitioners' requests to remove the restrictions on their licenses was a justice of the New York Supreme Court. If the officer denies an application, the applicant can obtain judicial review under Article 78 of New York's Civil Practice Law and Rules. 
New York courts will then review whether the denial was arbitrary and capricious. In describing New York's law, the court recites the above facts but adds its own gloss. It suggests that New York's licensing regime gives licensing officers too much discretion and provides too limited judicial review of their decisions, that the proper cause standard is too demanding, and that these features make New York an outlier compared to the vast majority of states. But on what evidence does the court base these characterizations? Recall that this case comes to us at the pleading stage. The parties have not had an opportunity to conduct discovery, and no evidentiary hearings have been held to develop the record. Thus, at this point, there is no record to support the court's negative characterizations, as we know very little about how the law has actually been applied on the ground. Consider each of the court's criticisms in turn. First, the court says that New York gives licensing officers too much discretion and leaves applicants little recourse if their local licensing officer denies a permit. But there is nothing unusual about broad statutory language that can be given more specific content by judicial interpretation, nor is there anything unusual or inadequate about subjecting licensing officers' decisions to arbitrary and capricious review. Judges routinely apply that standard, for example, to determine whether an agency action is lawful under both New York law and the Administrative Procedure Act. The arbitrary and capricious standard has thus been used to review important policies concerning health, safety, and immigration, to name just a few examples. Without an evidentiary record, there's no reason to assume that New York courts applying this standard fail to provide licensed applicants with meaningful review, and there is no evidentiary record to support the court's assumption here. Based on the pleadings alone, we cannot know how often New York courts find the denial of a concealed carry license to be arbitrary and capricious, or on what basis. We do not even know how a court would have reviewed the licensing officer's decisions in Koch's and Nash's cases because they do not appear to have sought judicial review at all. Second, the court characterizes New York's proper cause standard as substantively demanding. But again, the court has before it no evidentiary record to demonstrate how the standard has actually been applied. How demanding? Is the proper cause standard in practice? Does that answer differ from county to county? How many license applications are granted and denied each year? At the pleading stage, we do not know the answers to these and other important questions, so the court's characterization of New York's law may very well be wrong. In support of its assertion that the law is demanding, the court cites only to cases originating in New York City. But cases from New York City may not accurately represent how the proper cause standard is applied in other parts of the state, including in Rensselaer County where petitioners reside. To the contrary, Amici tell us that New York's licensing regime is purposefully flexible. It allows counties and cities to respond to the particular needs and challenges of each area. Amici suggests that some areas may interpret words such as proper cause or special need more or less strictly, depending upon each area's unique circumstances. New York City, for example, reports that it has applied the proper cause requirement relatively rigorously because its densely populated urban areas pose a heightened risk of gun violence. In comparison, other, perhaps more rural counties, have tailored the requirement to their own circumstances, often issuing concealed carry licenses more freely than the city. Given the geographic variation across the state, it is too sweeping for the court to suggest, without an evidentiary record, that the proper cause standard is demanding in Rensselaer County merely because it may be so in New York City. Finally, the court compares New York's licensing regime to that of other states.
It says that New York's law is a may issue licensing regime, which the court describes as a law that provides licensing officers greater discretion to grant or deny licenses than a shall issue licensing regime. Because the court counts 43 shall issue jurisdictions and only seven may issue jurisdictions, it suggests that New York's law is an outlier. Implicitly, the court appears to ask if so many other states have adopted the more generous shall issue approach, why can New York not be required to do the same? But the court's tabulation and its implicit question overlook important context. In drawing a line between may issue and shall issue licensing regimes, the court ignores the degree of variation within and across these categories. Not all may issue regimes are necessarily alike, nor are all shall issue regimes. Conversely, not all may issue regimes are as different from the shall issue regimes as the court assumes. For instance, the court recognizes in a footnote that three states, Connecticut, Delaware, and Rhode Island, have statutes with discretionary criteria like so-called may issue regimes do. But the court nonetheless counts them among the 43 shall issue jurisdictions because it says these three states' laws operate in practice more like shall issue regimes. As these three states demonstrate, the line between may issue and shall issue regimes is not as clear cut as the court suggests, and that line depends at least in part on how statutory discretion is applied in practice. Here, because the court strikes down New York's law without affording the state an opportunity to develop an evidentiary record, we do not know how much discretion licensing officers in New York have in practice or how that discretion is exercised, let alone how the licensing regimes in the other six may issue jurisdictions operate. Even accepting the court's line between may issue and shall issue regimes and assuming that its tally, seven may issue and 43 shall issue jurisdictions, is correct, that count does not support the court's implicit suggestion that the seven may issue jurisdictions are somehow outliers or anomalies. The court's count captures only a snapshot in time. It forgets that shall issue licensing regimes are a relatively recent development. Until the 1980s, may issue regimes predominated. As of 1987, 16 states and the District of Columbia prohibited concealed carriage outright. 26 states had may issue licensing regimes, seven states had shall issue regimes, and one state, Vermont, allowed concealed carriage without a permit. Thus, it has only been in the last few decades that states have shifted toward shall issue licensing laws. Prior to that, most states operated may issue licensing regimes without legal or practical problem. Moreover, even considering, as the court does, only the present state of play, its tally provides an incomplete picture because it accounts for only the number of states with may issue regimes, not the number of people governed by those regimes. By the court's count, the seven may issue jurisdictions are New York, California, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and the District of Columbia. Together, these seven jurisdictions comprise about 84.4 million people and account for over a quarter of the country's population. Thus, May issue laws can hardly be described as a marginal or outdated regime. And there are good reasons why these seven jurisdictions may have chosen not to follow other states in shifting toward shall issue regimes. The seven remaining May issue jurisdictions are among the most densely populated in the United States. The District of Columbia, with an average of 11,280 people per square mile in 2020, New Jersey, 1,263, Massachusetts, 901.2, Maryland, 636.1, New York, 428.7, California 
and Hawaii 226.6. In comparison, the average population density of the United States as a whole is 93.8 people per square mile, and some states have population densities as low as 1.3 Alaska, 5.9 Wyoming, and 7.4 Montana. These numbers reflect in part the fact that these may issue jurisdictions contain some of the country's densest and most populous urban areas. New York City, for example, has a population of about 8.5 million people, making it more populous than 38 states, and it squeezes that population into just over 300 square miles. As I explained above, densely populated urban areas face different kinds and degrees of dangers from gun violence than rural areas. It is thus easy to see why the seven may issue jurisdictions might choose to regulate firearm carriage more strictly than other states. New York and its Amici present substantial data justifying the state's decision to retain a May issue licensing regime. The data show that stricter gun regulations are associated with lower rates of firearm related death and injury. In particular, studies have shown that May issue licensing regimes like New York's, are associated with lower homicide rates and lower violent crime rates than shall issue licensing regimes. For example, one study compared homicide rates across all 50 states during the 25-year period from 1991 to 2015 and found that shall issue laws were associated with 6.5% higher total homicide rates 8.6% higher firearm homicide rates, and 10.6% higher handgun homicide rates. Another study longitudinally followed 33 states that had adopted shall-issue laws between 1981 and 2007 and found that the adoption of those laws was associated with a 13-15% to increase in rates of violent crime after 10 years. Justice Alito points to competing empirical evidence that arrives at a different conclusion, but these types of disagreements are exactly the sort that are better addressed by legislatures than courts. The court today restricts the ability of legislatures to fulfill that role. It does so without knowing how New York's law is administered in practice, how much discretion licensing officers in New York possess, or whether the proper cause standard differs across counties. And it does so without giving the state an opportunity to develop the evidentiary record to answer those questions, yet it strikes down New York's licensing regime as a violation of the Second Amendment. How does the court justify striking down New York's law without first considering how it actually works on the ground and what purposes it serves? The court does so by purporting to rely nearly exclusively on history. It requires the government to affirmatively prove that its firearms regulation is part of the historical tradition that delimits the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. Beyond this historical inquiry, the court refuses to employ what it calls means-ends scrutiny. That is, it refuses to consider whether New York has a compelling interest in regulating the concealed carriage of handguns or whether New York's law is narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Although I agree that history can often be a useful tool in determining the meaning and scope of constitutional provisions, I believe the court's near-exclusive reliance on that single tool today goes much too far. The court concedes that no court of appeals has adopted its rigid history-only approach. To the contrary, every court of appeals to have addressed the question has agreed on a two-step framework for evaluating whether a firearm regulation is consistent with the Second Amendment. At the first step, the courts of appeals use text and history to determine whether the regulated activity falls within the scope of the Second Amendment. If it does, 
they go on to the second step and consider the strength of the government's justification for restricting or regulating the Second Amendment right. In doing so, they apply a level of means-ends scrutiny that is proportionate to the severity of the burden that the law imposes on the right. Strict scrutiny if the burden is severe and intermediate scrutiny if it is not. The court today replaces the Courts of Appeals consensus framework with its own history-only approach. That is unusual. We do not normally disrupt settled consensus among the Courts of Appeals, especially not when that consensus approach has been applied without issue for over a decade. The court attempts to justify its deviation from our normal practice by claiming that the Courts of Appeals approach is inconsistent with Heller. In doing so, the court implies that all 11 Courts of Appeals that have considered this question misread Heller. To the contrary, it is this court that misreads Heller. The opinion in Heller did focus primarily on constitutional text and history, but it did not reject means and scrutiny, as the court claims. Consider what the Heller court actually said. True, the court spent many pages in Heller discussing the text and historical context of the Second Amendment. But that is not surprising because the Heller court was asked to answer the preliminary question whether the Second Amendment right to bear arms encompasses an individual right to possess a firearm in the home for self-defense. The Heller Court concluded that the Second Amendment's text and history were sufficiently clear to resolve that question. The Second Amendment, it said, does include such an individual right. There was thus no need for the court to go further, to look beyond text and history, or to suggest what analysis would be appropriate in other cases where the text and history are not clear. But the Heller Court did not end its opinion with that preliminary question. After concluding that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess a firearm for self-defense, the Heller Court added that that right is not unlimited. It thus had to determine whether the District of Columbia's law, which banned handgun possession in the home, was a permissible regulation of the right. In answering that second question, it said, under any of the standards of scrutiny that we have applied to enumerated constitutional rights. Banning the home from the most preferred firearm in the nation to keep and use for protection of one's home and family would fail constitutional muster. That language makes clear that the Heller Court understood some form of means and scrutiny to apply. It did not need to specify whether that scrutiny should be intermediate or strict because, in its view, the district's handgun ban was so severe that it would have failed either level of scrutiny. Despite Heller's express invocation of means and scrutiny, the court today claims that the majority in Heller rejected means and scrutiny because it rejected my dissent in that case. But that argument misreads both my dissent and the majority opinion. My dissent in Heller proposed directly weighing the interests protected by the Second Amendment on one side and the governmental public safety concerns on the other. I would have asked whether the statute burdens a protected interest in a way or to an extent that is out of proportion to the statute's salutary effects upon other important governmental interests. The majority rejected my dissent, not because I proposed using means and scrutiny, but because, in its view, I had done the opposite. In its own words, the majority faulted my dissent for proposing a freestanding, interest-balancing approach that accorded with none of the traditionally expressed levels of scrutiny, which are strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, or rational basis. The majority further made clear that its rejection of freestanding interest balancing did not extend to traditional forms of means and scrutiny. It said, We know of no other enumerated constitutional right 
whose core protection has been subjected to a freestanding interest balancing approach. To illustrate this point, it cited as an example the First Amendment right to free speech. Judges, of course, regularly use means and scrutiny, including both strict and intermediate scrutiny, when they interpret or apply the First Amendment. The majority, therefore, cannot have intended its opinion, consistent with our First Amendment jurisprudence, to be read as rejecting all traditional forms of means and scrutiny. As Heller's First Amendment example illustrates, the court today is wrong when it says that its rejection of means and scrutiny and near-exclusive focus on history accords with how we protect other constitutional rights. As the court points out, we do look to history in the First Amendment context to determine whether the expressive conduct falls outside of the category of protected speech. But if conduct falls within a category of protected speech, we then use means and scrutiny to determine whether a challenged regulation unconstitutionally burdens that speech. And the degree of scrutiny we apply often depends on the type of speech burdened and the severity of the burden. Additionally, beyond the right to freedom of speech, we regularly use means and scrutiny in cases involving other constitutional provisions. The upshot is that applying means and scrutiny to laws that regulate the Second Amendment right to bear arms would not create a constitutional anomaly. Rather, it is the court's rejection of means and scrutiny and adoption of a rigid history-only approach that is anomalous. The court's near-exclusive reliance on history is not only unnecessary, it is deeply impractical. It imposes a task on the lower courts that judges cannot easily accomplish. Judges understand well how to weigh a law's objectives, its ends, against the methods used to achieve those objectives, its means. Judges are far less accustomed to resolving difficult historical questions. Courts are, after all, staffed by lawyers, not historians. Legal experts typically have little experience answering contested historical questions or applying those answers to resolve contemporary problems. The court's insistent that judges and lawyers rely nearly exclusively on history to interpret the Second Amendment thus raises a host of troubling questions. Consider, for example, the following. Do lower courts have the research resources necessary to conduct exhaustive historical analyses in every Second Amendment case? What historical regulations and decisions qualify as representative analogs to modern laws? How will justices determine which historians have better views of close historical questions? Will the meaning of the Second Amendment change if or when new historical evidence becomes available? And most importantly, will the court's approach permit judges to reach outcomes they prefer and then cloak those outcomes in the language of history? Consider Heller itself. That case, fraught with difficult historical questions, illustrates the practical problems with expecting courts to decide important constitutional questions based solely on history. The majority in Heller undertook 40 pages of textual and historical analysis and concluded that the Second Amendment's protection of the right to keep and bear arms historically encompassed an individual right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation, that is, for self-defense. Justice Stevens' dissent conducted an equally searching textual and historical inquiry and concluded to the contrary that the terms bear arms was an idiom that protected only the right to use and possess arms in conjunction with service in a well-regulated militia. I do not intend to relitigate Heller here. I accept its holding as a matter of stare decisis, I refer to its historical analysis only to show the difficulties inherent in answering historical questions and to suggest that judges do not have the expertise needed 
to answer those questions accurately. For example, the Heller majority relied heavily on its interpretation of the English Bill of Rights. Citing Blackstone, the majority claimed that the English Bill of Rights protected a right of having and using arms for self-preservation and defense. The majority interpreted that language to mean that a private right to bear arms for self-defense having nothing whatever to do with service in the militia. Two years later, however, 21 English and early American historians, including experts at top universities, told us in McDonald v. Chicago that Heller Court had gotten the history wrong. The English Bill of Rights did not protect an individual's right to possess, own, or use arms for private purposes such as to defend a home against burglars. Rather, these Amici historians explained, the English right to have arms ensured that the crown could not deny Parliament, which represented the people, the power to arm the landed gentry and raise a militia, or the right of the people to possess arms to take part in that militia, should the sovereign usurp the laws, liberties, estates, and Protestant religion of the nation. Thus, the English right did protect a right of self-preservation and defense, as Blackstone said, but that right was to be exercised not by individuals acting privately or independently, but as a militia organized by their elected representatives. The court, not an expert in history, had misread Blackstone and other sources explaining the English Bill of Rights. And that was not the Heller Court's only questionable judgment. The majority rejected Justice Stevens' argument that the Second Amendment's use of the words bare arms drew on an idiomatic meaning that, at the time of the founding, commonly referred to military service. Linguistics experts now tell us that the majority was wrong to do so. Since Heller was decided... Experts have searched over 120,000 founding-era texts from between 1760 and 1799, as well as 40,000 texts from sources dating as far back as 1475 for historical uses of the phrase bare arms, and they concluded that the phrase was overwhelmingly used to refer to war, soldiering, or other forms of armed action by a group rather than an individual. These are just two examples. Other scholars have continued to write books and articles arguing that the court's decision in Heller misread the text and history of the Second Amendment. I repeat that I do not cite these arguments in order to relitigate Heller. I wish only to illustrate the difficulties that may befall lawyers and judges when they attempt to rely solely on history to interpret the Constitution. In Heller, we attempted to determine the scope of the Second Amendment right to bear arms by conducting a historical analysis, and some of us arrived at a very different conclusions based on the same historical sources. Many experts now tell us that the court got it wrong in a number of ways. That is understandable given the difficulty of the inquiry that the court attempted to undertake. The court's past experience with historical analysis should serve as a warning against relying exclusively or nearly exclusively on this mode of analysis in the future. Failing to heed that warning, the court today does just that. Its near-exclusive reliance on history will pose a number of practical problems. First, the difficulties attendant to extensive historical analysis will be especially acute in the lower courts. The court's historical analysis in this case is over 30 pages long and reviews numerous original sources from over 600 years of English and American history. Lower courts, especially district courts, typically have fewer research resources, less assistance from Amici historians, and higher caseloads than we do. They are therefore ill-equipped to conduct the type of searching historical surveys that the court's approach requires. Tellingly, 
Even the courts of appeals that have addressed the question presented here have in large part avoided extensive historical analysis. In contrast, lawyers and courts are well equipped to administer means ends scrutiny, which is regularly applied in a variety of constitutional context. Second, the court's opinion today compounds these problems, for it gives the lower courts precious little guidance regarding how to resolve modern constitutional questions based almost solely on history. The court declines to provide an exhaustive survey of the features that render regulations relevantly similar under the Second Amendment other than noting that its history-only analysis is neither a straitjacket nor a blank check, the court offers little explanation of how stringently its tests should be applied. Ironically, the only two relevant metrics that the court does identify are how and why a gun control regulation burdens the right to armed self-defense. In other words, the court believes that the most relevant metrics of comparison are a regulation's means, how, and ends, why, even as it rejects the utility of means and scrutiny. What the court offers instead is a laundry list of reasons to discount seemingly relevant historical evidence. The court believes that some historical laws and decisions cannot justify upholding modern regulations because, it says, they were outliers. It explains that just two court decisions or three colonial laws are not enough to satisfy its test. But the court does not say how many cases or laws would suffice to show a tradition of public carry regulation. Other laws are irrelevant, the court claims, because they are too dissimilar from New York's concealed carry licensing regime. But the court does not say what representative historical analog short of a twin or a dead ringer would suffice. Indeed, the court offers many and varied reasons to reject potential representative analogs, but very few reasons to accept them. At best, the numerous justifications that the court finds for rejecting historical evidence give judges ample tools to pick their friends out of history's crowd. At worst, they create a one-way ratchet that will disqualify virtually any representative historical analog and make it nearly impossible to sustain common-sense regulations necessary to our nation's safety and security. Third, even under ideal conditions, historical evidence will often fail to provide clear answers to difficult questions. As an initial matter, many aspects of the history of firearms and their regulation are ambiguous, contradictory, or disputed. Unsurprisingly, the extent to which colonial statutes enacted over 200 years ago were actually enforced, the basis for an acquittal in a 17th century decision, and the interpretation of English laws from the Middle Ages are often less than clear and even historical experts may reach conflicting conclusions based on the same sources. As a result, history, as much as any other interpretive method, leaves ample discretion to look over the heads of the crowd for one's friends. Fourth, I fear that history will be an especially inadequate tool when it comes to modern cases presenting modern problems. Consider the court's apparent preference for founding era regulation. Our country confronted profoundly different problems during that time period than it does today. Society at the founding was predominantly rural. In 1790, most of America's relatively small population of just 4 million people lived on farms or in small towns. Even in New York City, the largest American city then, as it is now, had a population of just 33,000 people. Small founding era towns are unlikely to have faced the same degrees and types of risks from gun violence as major metropolitan areas do today, so the types of regulations they adopted are unlikely to address modern needs. This problem is all the more acute 
when it comes to modern day circumstances that the framers could not have anticipated. How can we expect laws and cases that are over a century old to dictate the legality of regulations targeting ghost guns constructed with the aid of three-dimensional printers? Or modern laws requiring all gun shops to offer smart guns, which can only be fired by authorized users? Or laws imposing additional criminal penalties for the use of bullets capable of piercing body armor? The court's answer is that judges will simply have to employ analogical reasoning. But as I explained above, the court does not provide clear guidance on how to apply such reasoning. Even seemingly straightforward historical restrictions on firearm use may prove surprisingly difficult to apply to modern circumstances. The court affirms Heller's recognition that states may forbid public carriage in sensitive places. But what in 21st century New York City may properly be considered a sensitive place? Presumably, legislative assemblies, polling places, and courthouses, which the court tells us were among the relatively few places where weapons were altogether prohibited in the 18th and 19th centuries. On the other hand, the court also tells us that expanding the category of sensitive places simply to all places of public congregation that are not isolated from law enforcement defines that category far too broadly. So where does that leave the many locations in a modern city with no obvious 18th or 19th century analog? What about subways, nightclubs, movie theaters, and sports stadiums? The court does not say. Although I hope fervently that future courts will be able to identify historical analogs supporting the validity of regulations that address new technologies, I fear that it will often prove difficult to identify analogous technological and social problems from medieval England, the founding era, or the time period in which the 14th Amendment was ratified. Laws addressing repeating crossbows, lonskies, dirks, dags, skeins, stiliters, and other ancient weapons will be of little help to courts confronting modern problems. And as technological progress pushes our society ever further beyond the bounds of the framers' imaginations, attempts at analogical reasoning will become increasingly tortured. In short, a standard that relies solely on history is unjustifiable and unworkable. Indeed, the court's application of its history-only test in this case demonstrates the very pitfalls described above. The historical evidence reveals a 700-year Anglo-American tradition of regulating the public carriage of firearms in general and concealed or concealable firearms in particular. The court spends more than half of its opinion trying to discredit this tradition, but in my view, The robust evidence of such a tradition cannot be so easily explained away. Laws regulating the public carriage of weapons existed in England as early as the 13th century, and on this continent since before the founding. Similar laws remained on the books through the ratifications of the 2nd and 14th Amendments through to the present day. Many of those historical regulations impose significantly stricter restrictions on public carriage than New York's licensing requirements do today. Thus, even applying the court's history-only analysis, New York's law must be upheld because historical precedent from before, during, and after the founding evinces a comparable tradition of regulation. England The right codified by the Second Amendment was inherited from our English ancestors. And some of England's earliest laws regulating the public carriage of weapons were precursors of similar American laws enacted roughly contemporaneously with the ratification of the Second Amendment. I therefore begin, as the court does, with the English ancestors of New York's laws regulating public carriage of firearms. The relevant English history begins in the late 13th and early 14th centuries, when Edward I, 
and Edward II issued a series of orders to local sheriffs that prohibited any person from going armed. Violators were subject to punishment, including forfeiture of life and limb. Many of these royal edicts contained exemptions for persons who had, who had obtained the king's special license. Like New York's laws, these early edicts prohibited public carriage, absent special governmental permission, and enforced that prohibition on pain of punishment. The court seems to suggest that these early regulations are irrelevant because they were enacted during a time of turmoil when malefactors harried the country, committing assaults and murders. But it would seem to me that what the court characterizes as a right of armed self-defense would be more rather than less necessary during a time of turmoil. The court also suggests that laws that were enacted before firearms arrived in England, like these early edicts and the subsequent statute of Northampton, are irrelevant. But why should that be? Pre-gun regulations prohibiting going armed in public illustrate an entrenched tradition of restricting public carriage of weapons. That tradition seems as likely to apply to firearms as to any other lethal weapons, particularly if we follow the court's instructions to use analogical reasoning. And indeed, as we shall see shortly, the most significant firearm regulation of public carriage, the statute of Northampton, was in fact applied to guns once they appeared in England. The statute of Northampton was enacted in 1328, by its terms, the statute made it a criminal offense to carry arms without the king's authorization. It provided that, without such authorization, no man, great nor small, of what condition soever he be, could go nor ride armed by night nor by day in fairs, markets, nor in the presence of the justices or other ministers, nor in no part elsewhere upon pain to forfeit their armor to the king and their bodies to prison at the king's pleasure. For more than a century following its enactment, England's sheriffs were routinely reminded to strictly enforce the statute of Northampton against those going armed without the king's permission. The court thinks that the statute of Northampton has little bearing on the Second Amendment. In part, because it was enacted more than 450 years before the ratification of the Constitution. The statute, however, remained in force for hundreds of years, well into the 18th century. It was discussed in the writings of Blackstone, Coke, and others. And several American colonies and states enacted restrictions modeled on the statute. There is thus every reason to believe that the framers of the Second Amendment would have considered the statute of Northampton a significant chapter in the Anglo-American tradition of firearms regulation. The court also believes that, by the end of the 17th century, the statute of Northampton was understood to contain an extra-textual intent element, the intent to cause terror in others. The court relies on two sources that arguably suggest that view. A 1686 decision, Sir John Knight's case, and a 1716 treatise written by Sergeant William Hawkins. But other sources suggest that carrying arms in public was prohibited because it naturally tended to terrify people. According to these sources, terror was the natural consequence, not an additional element of the crime. I find this view more persuasive in large part because it is not entirely clear that the two sources the court relies on actually support the existence of an intent to terrify requirement. Start with Sir John Knight's case, which according to the court, considered Knight's arrest for walking about the streets and into a church armed with guns. 
The court thinks that Knight's acquittal by a jury demonstrates that the statute of Northampton only prohibited public carriage of firearms with an intent to terrify. But by now, the legal significance of Knight's acquittal is impossible to reconstruct. The primary source describing the case was notoriously incomplete at the time Sir John Knight's case was decided, and the facts that historians can reconstruct do not uniformly support the court's interpretation. The King's Bench required Knight to pay a surety to guarantee his future good behavior, so it may be more accurate to think of the case as having ended in a conditional pardon than acquittal. And notably, it appears that Knight based his defense on his loyalty to the crown, not a lack of intent to terrify. Similarly, the passage from the Hawkins Treaties on which the court relies states that the statute of Northampton's prohibition on the public carriage of weapons did not apply to the wearing of arms unless it be accompanied with such circumstances as are apt to terrify the people. But Hawkins goes on to enumerate relatively narrow circumstances where this exception applied. When persons of quality wear common weapons or have their usual number of attendants with them for their ornament or defense in such places and upon such occasions in which it is the common fashion to make use of them or to persons merely wearing privy coats of mail. It would make little sense if a narrow exception for nobility and privy coats of mail were allowed to swallow the broad rule that Hawkins and other commentators of his time described elsewhere. That rule provided that there may be an affray where there is no actual violence, as where a man arms himself with dangerous and unusual weapons in such a manner as will naturally cause a terror to the people, which is strictly prohibited by the statute of Northampton. And it provided no exception for those who attempted to excuse the wearing such armor in public by alleging that he wears it for the safety of his person from assault. In my view, that rule announces the better reading of the statute of Northampton, as a broad prohibition on the public carriage of firearms and other weapons without an intent to terrify requirement or exception for self-defense. Although the statute of Northampton is particularly significant because of its breadth, longevity, and impact on American law, it was far from the only English restriction on firearms or their carriage. Whatever right to bear arms we inherited from our English forebears, it was qualified by a robust tradition of public carriage regulations. As I have made clear, I am not a historian, but if the foregoing facts which historians and other scholars have presented to us are even roughly correct, it is difficult to see how the court can believe that English history fails to support legal restrictions on the public carriage of firearms. The Colonies The American colonies continued the English tradition of regulating public carriage on this side of the Atlantic. In 1686, the colony of East New Jersey passed a law providing that no person or persons shall presume privately to wear any pocket pistol, daggers or dirks or other unusual or unlawful weapons within this province. East New Jersey also specifically prohibited planters from riding or going armed with sword, pistol, or dagger. Massachusetts Bay and New Hampshire followed suit in 1692 and 1771 respectively, enacting laws that, like the Statute of Northampton, provided that those who went armed offensively could be punished. It is true, as the court points out, that these laws were only enacted in three colonies, but that does not mean that they may be dismissed as outliers. They were successors to several centuries of comparable laws in England and predecessors to numerous similar 
in some cases, materially identical laws enacted by the states after the founding. And while it may be true that these laws applied only to dangerous and unusual weapons, that category almost certainly included guns. Finally, the court points out that New Jersey's ban on public carriage applied only to certain people or to the concealed carriage of certain smaller firearms. But the court's refusal to credit the relevance of East New Jersey's law on this basis raises a serious question about what, short of a twin or a dead ringer, qualifies as a relevant historical analog. The Founding Era The tradition of regulations restricting public carriage of firearms inherited from England and adopted by the colonies continued into the founding era. Virginia, for example, enacted a law in 1786 that, like the Statute of Northampton, prohibited any person from going nor riding armed by day nor by night in fairs or markets or in other places in terror of the country. And, as the court acknowledges, public carry restrictions proliferated after the Second Amendment's ratification five years later in 1791. Just a year after that, North Carolina enacted a law whose language was lifted from the Statute of Northampton virtually verbatim. Other states passed similar laws in the late 18th and 19th centuries. The court discounts these laws primarily because they were modeled on the Statute of Northampton, which it believes prohibited only public carriage with the intent to terrify. I have previously explained why I believe that preventing public terror was one reason that the Statute of Northampton prohibited public carriage, but not an element of the crime. And consistent with that understanding, American regulations modeled on the Statute of Northampton appear to have been understood to set forth a broad prohibition on public carriage of firearms without any intent to terrify requirement. The court cites three cases considering common law offenses, but those cases do not support the view that only public carriage in a manner likely to terrify violated American successors to the statute of Northampton. If anything, they suggest that public carriage of firearms was not common practice. At least one of the cases the court cites, State v. Huntley, wrote that the statute of Northampton codified a pre-existing common law offense which provided that riding or going armed with dangerous or unusual weapons is a crime against the public peace by terrifying the good people of the land. Huntley added that a gun is an unusual weapon and that no man amongst us carries it about with him as one of his everyday accoutrements, as part of his dress, and never, we trust, will the day come when any deadly weapon will be worn or wielded in our peace-loving and law-abiding state as an appendage of manly equipment. True, Huntley recognized that citizens were nonetheless at perfect liberty to carry for lawful purposes, but it specified that those purposes were business or amusement. New York's law similarly recognizes that hunting, target shooting, and certain professional activities are proper causes justifying the lawful carriage of a firearm. The other two cases the court cites for this point similarly offer it only limited support, either because the atextual intent element the court advocates was irrelevant to the decision's result or because the decision adopted an outlier position not reflected in the other cases cited by the court. The founding era regulations, like the colonial and English laws on which they were modeled, thus demonstrate a long-standing tradition of broad restrictions on public carriage of firearms. The 19th century Beginning in the 19th century, states began to innovate on the statute of Northampton in at least two ways. 
First, many states and territories passed bans on concealed carriage or on any carriage, concealed or otherwise, of certain concealable weapons. For example, Georgia made it unlawful to carry, unless in an open manner and fully exposed to view, any pistol, dirk, sword, cane, spear, bowie knife, or any other kind of knives manufactured and sold for the purpose of offense and defense. Other states and territories enacted similar prohibitions, and the territory of New Mexico appears to have banned all carriage whatsoever of any class of pistols whatever, as well as Bowie knives, Arkansas's toothpicks, Spanish daggers, slung shots, or any other deadly weapon. These 19th century bans on concealed carriage were stricter than New York's law, for they prohibited concealed carriage with at most limited exceptions. While New York permits concealed carriage with a lawfully obtained license. Moreover, as Heller recognized and the court acknowledges, the majority of the 19th century courts to consider the question held that these types of prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons were lawful under the Second Amendment or state analogs. The court discounts this history because it says courts in four southern states suggested or held that a ban on concealed carriage was only lawful if open carriage or carriage of military pistols was allowed. Several of these decisions, however, emphasize states' leeway to regulate firearms carriage as necessary to protect the orderly and well-disposed citizens from the treacherous use of weapons not even designed for any purpose of public defense. And other courts upheld concealed carry restrictions without any reference to an exception allowing open carriage, So, it is far from clear that the cases the court cites represent a consensus view. And, of course, the court does not say whether the result in this case would be different if New York allowed open carriage by law-abiding citizens as a matter of course. The second 19th century innovation adopted in a number of states was surety laws. Massachusetts surety law, which served as a model for laws adopted by many other states, provided that any person who went armed with a dirk, dagger, sword, pistol, or other offensive and dangerous weapon, and who lacked reasonable cause to fear assault, could be made to pay a surety upon the complaint of any person having reasonable cause to fear an injury or breach of the peace. Other states and territories enacted identical or substantially similar laws. These laws resemble New York's licensing regime in many, though admittedly not all, relevant respects. Most notably, like New York's proper cause requirement, the surety laws conditioned public carriage in at least some circumstances on a special showing of need. The court believes that the absence of recorded cases involving surety laws means that they were rarely enforced. Of course, this may just as well show that these laws were normally followed. In any case, scholars cited by the court tell us that traditional case law research is not especially probative of the application of these restrictions because in many cases, those records did not survive the passage of time or are not well indexed or digitally searchable. On the contrary, the fact that restrictions on public carry were well accepted in places like Massachusetts and were included in the relevant manuals for justices of the peace suggests that violations were enforced at the justice of peace level, but did not result in expensive appeals that would have produced searchable case law. The surety laws and broader bans on concealed carriage enacted in the 19th century demonstrate that even relatively stringent restrictions on public carriage have long been understood to be consistent with the Second Amendment and its state equivalents. Postbellum Regulation 
After the Civil War, public carriage of firearms remained subject to extensive regulation. Of course, during this period, Congress provided that firearm regulations could not be designed or enforced in a discriminatory manner. But that by now uncontroversial proposition says little about the validity of non-discriminatory restrictions on public carriage, like New York's. What is more relevant for our purposes is the fact that in the postbellum period, states continued to enact generally applicable restrictions on public carriage, many of which were even more restrictive than their predecessors. Most notably, many states in Western territories enacted stringent regulations that prohibited any public carriage of firearms with only limited exceptions. For example, Texas made it a misdemeanor to carry in public any pistol, dirk, dagger, slung shot, sword cane, spear, brass knuckles, bowie knife, or any other kind of knife manufactured or sold for the purpose of offense or defense absent reasonable grounds for fearing an immediate and pressing unlawful attack. Similarly, New Mexico made it unlawful for any person to carry deadly weapons, either concealed or otherwise, on or about their persons within any of the settlements of this territory. New Mexico's prohibition contained only narrow exceptions for carriage on a person's own property, for self-defense in the face of immediate danger or with official authorization. Other states and territories adopted similar laws. When they were challenged, these laws were generally upheld. The court's principal answer to these broad prohibitions on public carriage is to discount gun control laws passed in the American West. It notes that laws enacted in the Western territories were rarely subject to judicial scrutiny, but of course, that may well mean that we can assume it's settled that these regulations were consistent with the Second Amendment. The court also reasons that laws enacted in the Western territories applied to a relatively small portion of the population and were comparatively short-lived. But even assuming that is true, it does not mean that these laws were historical aberrations. To the contrary, bans on public carriage in the American West and elsewhere constitute just one chapter of centuries-old tradition of comparable firearms regulations described above. The 20th Century The court disregards 20th century historical evidence. But it is worth noting that the law the court strikes down today is well over 100 years old, having been enacted in 1911 and amended to substantially its present form in 1913. That alone gives it a longer historical pedigree than at least three of the four types of firearms regulations that Heller identified as presumptively lawful. Like Justice Kavanaugh, I understand the court's opinion today to cast no doubt on that aspect of Heller's holding. But unlike Justice Kavanaugh, I find the disconnect between Heller's treatment of laws prohibiting, for example, firearms possession by felons or the mentally ill, and the court's treatment of New York's licensing regime hard to square. The inconsistency suggests that the court today takes either an unnecessarily cramped view of the relevant historical record or a needlessly rigid approach to analogical reasoning. The historical examples of regulation similar to New York's licensing regime are lesion. Closely analogous English laws were enacted beginning in the 13th century and similar American regulations were passed during the colonial period, the founding era, the 19th century, and the 20th century. Not all of these laws were identical to New York's, but that is inevitable in an analysis that demands examination of seven centuries of history. At a minimum, the laws I have recounted resembled New York's law, similarly restricting the right to public carry weapons and serving roughly similar purposes. That is all that the court's test, which allows and even encourages analogical reasoning, purports to require.
In each instance, the court finds a reason to discount the historical evidence's persuasive force. Some of the laws New York has identified are too old, but others are too recent. Still others did not last long enough. Some applied to too few people. Some were enacted for the wrong reasons. Some may have been based on a constitutional rationale that is now impossible to identify. Some arose in historically unique circumstances, and some are not sufficiently analogous to the licensing regime at issue here. But if the examples discussed above, taken together, do not show a tradition and history of regulation that supports the validity of New York's law, what could? Sadly, I do not know the answer to that question. What is worse, the court appears to have no answer either. We are bound by Heller insofar as Heller interpreted the Second Amendment to protect an individual right to possess a firearm for self-defense. But Heller recognized that the right was not without limits and could appropriately be subject to government regulation. Heller, therefore, does not require holding that New York's law violates the Second Amendment. In so holding, the court goes beyond Heller. It bases its decision to strike down New York's law almost exclusively on its application of what it calls historical analogical reasoning. As I have admitted above, I am not a historian and neither is the court. But the history, as it appears to me, seems to establish a robust tradition of regulations restricting the public carriage of concealed firearms. To the extent that any uncertainty remains between the court's view of the history and mine, that uncertainty counsels against relying on history alone. In my view, it is appropriate in such circumstances to look beyond the history and engage in what the court calls means and scrutiny. Courts must be permitted to consider the state's interest in preventing gun violence, the effectiveness of the contested law in achieving that interest, the degree to which the law burdens the Second Amendment right, and, if appropriate, any less restrictive alternatives. The Second Circuit has previously done just that, and it held that New York's law does not violate the Second Amendment. It first evaluated the degree to which the law burdens the Second Amendment right to bear arms. It concluded that the law places substantial limits on the ability of law-abiding citizens to possess firearms for self-defense in public, but does not burden the right to possess a firearm in the home, where Heller said the need for defense of self, family, and property is most acute. The Second Circuit therefore determined that the law should be subject to heightened scrutiny, but not to strict scrutiny and its attendant presumption of unconstitutionality. In applying such heightened scrutiny, the Second Circuit recognized that New York has a substantial, indeed compelling, governmental interest in public safety and crime prevention. I agree. As I have demonstrated above, Firearms in public present a number of dangers, ranging from mass shootings to road rage killings, and are responsible for many deaths and injuries in the United States. The Second Circuit then evaluated New York's law and concluded that it is substantially related to New York's compelling interests. To support that conclusion, the Second Circuit pointed to studies and data demonstrating that Widespread access to handguns in public increases the likelihood that felonies will result in death and fundamentally alters the safety and character of public spaces. We have before us additional studies confirming that conclusion. And we've been made aware of no less restrictive but equally effective alternative. After considering all of these factors, the Second Circuit held that New York's law does not unconstitutionally burden the right to bear arms under the Second Amendment. I would affirm that holding. New York's legislature considered the empirical evidence about gun violence and adopted a reasonable licensing law 
to regulate the concealed carriage of handguns in order to keep the people of New York safe. The court today strikes down that law based only on the pleadings. It gives the state no opportunity to present evidence justifying its reasons for adopting the law or showing how the law actually operates in practice, and it does not so much as acknowledge these important considerations. Because I cannot agree with the court's decision to strike New York's law down without allowing for discovery or the development of any evidentiary record, without considering the state's compelling interest in preventing gun violence and protecting the safety of its citizens, and without considering the potentially deadly consequences of its decision, I respectfully dissent.